much, Nick, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, today we're going to talk, like Nick was saying, we're going to talk about technical design. Uh, you know, when it comes down to the technicalities of how we do design, a lot of people have questions about how do you even go about starting. Um, you know, so you may have your topic in hand, you may have what you want to be able to cover, um, but you know, a lot of the challenges revolve around, okay, so what type of graphics do I use? Um, you know, how do I convey a specific piece of information? Um, you know, a lot of times we'll have our customers as we're starting to pull together modules go either one way or another. You know, maybe they'll be full bore into some 3D development and making something very, very complex and, and creative and innovative. Um, and then maybe we'll have the other end of the spectrum where everything is pretty much bullets in an image on the screen. We have a tendency to see that we either go one way or another. Um, and oftentimes it either has to do with personal preferences, it may have to do with um, things that we have experience with, it may have to do with budgets and whatnot. Um, but all too often I find unfortunately we don't actually let the content drive what, how, we, how we choose to convey a particular piece of information. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is how do we make that concept a little bit easier. Um, so how do we, you know, without doing weeks worth of analysis, which nobody has time to do anymore, how do we say, okay, I need to create a 20-minute module, how am I going to do it? You know, here are the different topics that I want to be able to convey, here's the objectives for the course, how am I going to go about doing it, what types of graphics, what types of interactions am I going to use, um, and how can I get from point A to point B very quickly so that I can get started on actually developing the content. And that's what we're going to discuss today. So when we have the design process and we think about the design process, um, we think about the Abbey model. It's a, a model that a lot of different organizations use. I've seen a lot of different models out there. Ultimately, it all comes down to the fact that we first need to analyze what we're going to create. We then need to come up with a design. We need to develop something. We then need to implement it so that our employees or our learners have access to it. And then we need to evaluate the work that we've done. At this phase, we're going to be talking about the design component of this. Um, there is actually a webinar that comes before this that we've done a couple of months back that talks about the analysis phase. But at the design phase, we really need to firm up the flow of the content and the tone of the training. So we need to go from here's what we need to cover in the training to this is how we're actually going to get it done. Typically in this, we're going to talk to decision makers, so whoever has the final say on what we're looking to convey. We're going to be talking to subject matter experts, and those are going to be really critical at this point in time. We need to have those subject matter experts on board because they're going to be able to convey to us the importance of a particular topic, the importance of a piece of information, and they're going to help us make the right decision. When you see that four to one ratio, it typically takes about four times as long as whatever your finish duration might be for this phase. So if you're looking at a 20-minute e-learning module, you may be talking about four times that to be able to, to participate in the design process. So that's four times the amount of time for the decision maker and the subject matter experts. So it's not the actual amount of time that it takes to get the design done. When we think about design, we want to think about four different types of information that we might be looking to convey. Um, we want to think about information that we want to inform someone of. So we're talking about really high level information. We're talking about um, this is a piece of equipment. We're talking about um, this is a, a concept that you need to be aware of. We're talking about this is a safety concern that you need to be cognizant of. We're really looking to inform them from an awareness perspective but not diving any deeper than that. When we start to talk about define, that's where we're going to take that information that we're conveying during the inform phase and we're going to get into a little bit more detail. So for example, if we're giving somebody a safety concern, we're going to go into more detail about what is that specific safety concern? What are the consequences of that? What's the, the PPE that needs to be involved to protect oneself and one's environment around that? Um, we're going to start to get into more degrees of detail and more intricate pieces of information in that defined phase. When we talk about practice, that's where we want to have our learners be able to experience um, whatever the concept is. So if it's, um, you know, using a forklift, um, if it's a particular procedure, that's where we want them to be able to practice working through 
um, whatever that procedure is. And then when we get to the apply phase, what the apply phase is, is that's where we're really kind of testing their knowledge. Um, think of this as a structured on-the-job training. Um, think of this as where we're trying to make sure before we send them out on their way to, to go forth with this information and do their jobs, we want to make certain that they've gotten out of the training what we want them to get out of. Now, along with each of these four buckets, and we're going to keep kind of coming back to these buckets in the next 20 minutes, um, we have to start to classify the information that we're looking to cover into one of these four buckets. And the reason for that is this. There's lots of different modes of communication that we can, we can use. So we can use pre-assessment. We can use just a short text description. We can use an overview video. We can use an audio. And you can see that those are classified in blue, and that's because those are really great tools to use at that um, informed phase. We also have photographs, interactive text, but you can see how this diagram, we're going to go into this in a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides. We have all of these different ways of communicating information. So it's not like we can only do bullets on a screen. It's not like we can only do 3D animation. It's not like we can only do on-the-job training. The best solutions and the most impactful solutions often incorporate all the different styles of learning that we could possibly come up with. But what we need to first do is we need to first think about what are we looking for that learner to know um, and to what degree are we looking for them. Are they informing? Are they defining? Are they practicing? Or are they applying? So let's dive into the inform. And we're going to classify these again into basic, medium, and advanced. And the reason why we do this is because we want to make sure that we're using the right method um, for whatever the type of information is. So if we're basic, we're talking about just short text description, so you know, one, a one-sentence definition, or maybe even a pre-assessment that we just want to assess their knowledge to see if they have it before they start taking the training session. From a medium perspective, we might just use a short audio clip to explain. From an advanced perspective, we might use an overview video instead. As we start to talk about define, we have a lot more to choose from because the bulk of what we do a lot is, is defining. So we might use some interactive text where they can click on different things to highlight more information. We might have an in-person activity because this isn't limited to just e-learning type of training. Maybe there's a diagram that's going to pull out different components or photographs that we can use to compare different types of equipment. Uh, there might be a knowledge check or maybe you have an in-person walk down a particular piece of equipment. So if you're training somebody on how to use a generator, you want to first define for them the different components of that generator. So you might do a walk down of the equipment so they can get familiar with everything that they're going to be looking at and using. As we get into medium, we start to have two-dimensional graphics, exploratory two-dimensional graphics where they can click on the graphic to see more, animated 2D graphics, exploratory diagrams, exploratory photographs. So this is where we're starting to get a little bit more um, kinesthetic. So we're starting to interact with the information that we're being presented instead of just a static image. And then as we get to the more advanced, we're going to see 3D cutaways, 3D animations, explanatory videos. So the advanced is for advanced concepts, but it's also an advanced type of material that we're producing. We want to be very careful when we're doing these. These are great for things that we can repurpose, great for things that we can reuse, and great for things that aren't going to change a lot in the future. From a practice perspective, this is where we really start to, to draw that line between something that can be conducted during e-learning and something that's best achieved during hands-on. Um, e-learning is great for that inform and that define phase. Um, you can do some elements of practice in e-learning, but a lot of that practice should really be hands-on, um, actually using equipment, actually working through procedures. So we might have a case study. We might have an in-person cutaway. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we do a lot of is we have industrial level training equipment. So training equipment that's not the actual equipment that they'll be using, um, but it's a training environment um, that they can start to experience with, with different hydraulic trainers, electrical trainers, mechanical trainers. We have procedural activities. We have walk down teach back. Uh, for the advanced, we might have role play scenarios or games, troubleshooting activities or on the job training. And that's always going to be a structured on the job. Uh, when we get to the apply, that's really that capstone assessment. So that's going to be that final assessment to make sure that they got everything out of the training that they need to. So that's a lot of information. And if you're new to the, the uh, training, and, training world or maybe you're a subject matter expert that doesn't have a training background 
or maybe some of these concepts are things that you haven't used yet, that can be kind of overwhelming as you start to go into to how do I decide when to use these different things. So a couple of reminders of things to just keep in mind. The basic formats are really great for anything that's easily edited or frequently changing. So if you have information that you know is going to change frequently, stick to those basic formats because it's going to give you the most flexibility. Medium formats are going to be more engaging, um, so you want them for things that are maybe more sustainable, but they're also fairly easy to edit so you don't have to worry too, too much about being able to uh, edit those kinds of things in the future. And then advanced formats are best for reusable content that has a really long shelf life. So think about um, equipment that's not going to change. Think about um, things that you can repurpose. Think about things that you can repurpose even within a series of modules. Um, so if you have a generator that you're using throughout your, your plant or throughout um, your environment, that may be a great thing to do with 3D because you're going to get a lot of use out of it. Now, how do we go about taking all of that information that I covered in a very short time span and get that into a training? Well, we have a process that works really well for helping to brainstorm through this concept. Um, so what we have is a series of flashcards, and the flashcards are all of the different components that I just covered, color-coded um, into the informed Define Practice and Applied Color Codes. And then on the back of them, they're going to tell you whether they're medium, basic, medium, or advanced, and they're going to give you a short description. So what we would typically do is this. We would have everybody kind of sit in a room around a conference room table. So this one works really great in groups if you can get your subject matter experts, your decision makers, your training people. Um, you know, people, I typically sit in on these sessions as well to start to do the brainstorming process. You're going to break out your set of cards into the three, into the four different categories and put them up at the top of the table. And then we might think of something like um, forklift safety. And I always get, like to use forklift safety because whether you're in a heavy industrial, whether you're in a warehouse, a lot of people are going to have some sort of movable equipment. Um, so let's think about if we're training somebody on forklift forklift safety and we have some information that we're going to need to convey. Uh, we are going to want them to practice and apply that, but that's really not going to be the focus of this first training session we're going to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to set those aside because we're not going to really be focusing on those today. The focus is going to be on the inform and the define phase. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to examine those options. So you would spread out your cards and your cards are going to go out on the table to look at what the different options are for inform. So you have the overview video, you have the audio, you have the pre-assessment. Um, at your seat, we would ask a question about if I want to tell somebody about forklift safety and what are the, why, why do we care about forklift safety from an informed perspective. At your seat, you would be able to flip these cards over um, and you would be able to see exactly what you need to talk about or what you need to consider um, on your own. So it's not a large group discussion yet, but everybody's going to sit to themselves and go, okay, well, I think it should be a short text. Um, I think it should be audio. I think it should be a pre-assessment to see how much people know going into, into the session. And then everybody kind of votes on what they think is the most appropriate thing. The great part about these cards is that, number one, you can use an inform and a define at the same time. So maybe you start with a pre-assessment and then go into an exploratory 2D graphic. Um, the other thing is, is if you start to see the, you, you using the same cards over and over and over again, then you know that you're focusing too much on one style of learning. So you might want to set that card aside um, and eliminate that from the possibilities. Other things that you might notice is you might notice that you're not using any of the on-the-job training. You're not using any of the hands-on instructions. So you might want to bring those cards to the forefront. So it kind of helps you keep track. Um, it's a very tactile activity where everybody gets to be involved. Um, it's actually really fun to see people in the room kind of starting to argue and arm wrestle over these different options and how they, how they want to convey a specific piece of information. So as we go into some case studies, so here's a case study of a forklift training course uh, where we're really just covering the high-level overview of why we need to care about um, forklift safety. In this example, we just used a simple diagram. Um, we wanted to animate it so that we could see some, some very basic um, animations. We weren't really looking into the specifics about um, you know, any of the PPE that's involved. We weren't looking into any of the specifics. It was more for a graphical treatment. So for that, we really don't need to have any kind of fancy 3D animation for it. Um, you know, we just wanted it to be very basic, very much a high-level overview. 
And so this was where a diagram worked out really great. So you can obviously see from the diagram that it's a forklift, but nobody's going to get caught up in, well, that's not the forklift that I have. Um, you know, ours is red or ours is yellow or ours is, is this brand or that brand or what have you. Um, you know, you can really focus on the information that's being conveyed from an awareness perspective. In a different case study, we might be talking about more specifics. So we're going to be talking about, um, you know, where things need to be secured. We're going to be talking about the, having the fork lowered. We're going to be talking about, um, you know, the actual uh, how to put something in neutral, how to set the brakes, how to turn the ignition on and off. Here we're going to want to be able to provide more levels of detail. So in this example, we have um, a 2D graphic so that we can get a little bit more detail. We can start to get some of the coloring in there. We can start to make it look a little bit more realistic. But again, it's still a very static image. So there's going to be some, some call-outs there to give more information. This is actually a part of a larger manual. Um, so it's going to give you more information and more level of detail. But again, we don't need to get into necessarily photographs. We want to keep it kind of simplified so that it applies across the board. As we get into something where maybe in a particular organization and in this situation there were three different types of forklifts um, that somebody may run across um, within the, the plant, here we do want to start using photographs. Um, the reason for using the photographs is because we want them to be able to recognize these different types. Um, these were also exploratory photographs where the learner was able to click on these different photographs and it was going to display more information. So it may display specific safety warnings or safety things that they need to be aware of. Um, it may display some other information about it, where they might find this particular fork truck over a different Excuse me. Over a different fork truck, um, it's going to give them more information and more level of detail. But it's really going to help them start to recognize those and recognize what's the difference between a class 4A, a class 7, and a class 4B. In this next scenario, we've actually gone through and done some 3D animation. This is a, an example of again, it's it's a much more um, Familiar, familiar fork truck, so it, it is specific to the organization. But in this scenario, we actually were going to do a, a 3D simulation. So in this case, it made a lot of sense to create a forklift that we could then animate, we could show an incident, um, we could show what happens, and then we can actually repurpose that throughout the module. So we can use it to create static images. In the example that you can see here, this was a, an exploratory 3D graphic. The learner would be able to click on those different parts of the image to display more information. And you can see in the lower left-hand corner, we're actually able to superimpose a tiny video showing a different perspective. So in these little, little case studies, you can see how it was the same content, um, it was the same topic, but you can see how, depending on what you're looking to convey, depending on what information you're looking to cover, there's a lot of different options that, that you may run across. And that's where the, the flashcards and the informed, defined, practice, and apply comes in handy as you can start to think about what is the specific content that you're looking to convey and how, what is the best approach that you can use. So consider that reuse is a reason to use a more engaging format. So in the example of the 3D animation that we, we created, the reason why we did 3D animation was because we got so much reuse out of that 3D animation throughout the module. You know, not only from the standpoint of showing different perspectives of the same situation, but then being able to basically create our own stock photos um, using a common graphic throughout it instead of having to kind of search through stock libraries or photographs to try and find the exact pictures we were looking for. If we're already going through the effort to create that 3D model for the 3D animation, then we may as well reuse that graphic as much as possible. Remember, as you're working through the activity, to set aside cards that are used frequently to keep a good blend. A lot of times when people have an organization where they're focused on instructor led training and they want to move to more of an e-learning type of a solution, we unfortunately go to the way of I have three weeks of e-learning and now I have 30 hours, or I have three weeks of ILT, I now have 30 hours of e-learning. ILT and e-learning, really, one isn't better than the other. The best thing that you can do is to make that good blend, make that solid blend of 
a little bit of ILT when it's most important, e-learning when it's most important, and again, that hands-on, um, you know, to make sure that we're transferring that knowledge and make sure that they're, they're capturing those skills. As you're choosing, also make sure that you consider the propensity of change and choose easily maintainable formats. So if you're going into specifics of a specific procedure, you're going into set points, you're going into any degree of detail that may change, there you're going to want to use some of those basic, um, basic types of interactions. And the only reason for that is because it's going to make it a lot easier for you to maintain that content moving forward because training is only as good as it is accurate. Um, if you wind up having to have a, you know, a, a 40 to 60 day turnaround time to update your training, then that's 40 to 60 days in which your training is out of date and inaccurate, and that can put you at, at a substantial risk. So consider that as one of the elements that you use to decide how you're looking to convey your information. So from a next steps perspective, um, just to kind of complete out the adding model, the next steps would be once we decide how we're looking to convey things, we would start to develop the actual training content. Um, so this stage, we're going to need to fine tune that message, the text, and the imagery. So this is where we get to see how we take all of those different components that we were just talking about and the different modalities and to start to put them into something that we can actually work with, we can show to some users and see how they react to that specific content. We're then going to go into implementation, which is where we're going to have um, this actually go out on a learning management system. If it's an instructor with training, we're actually going to conduct a class. Maybe we'll conduct it as a pilot first. Um, that's always a really great thing to be able to do if you have the time. Um, but we're going to get that implemented to make sure that everything functions the way that it will. reason why I do cover this in this session, although we're not going to go into much specifics, I will say that implementation is something you should consider very early in the process. So consider things like bandwidth, consider things like whether you're deploying via mobile, consider things like what your internet speed looks like, your internet accessibility looks like when you're making some of these decisions earlier on so that you don't run into challenges when you get to implementation. And then finally, we're going to get to evaluate. Um, and evaluate is where we get to see, did the learners learn what they were supposed to? Um, how did the training come off? Did people really like it? Were people engaged? Uh, we're going to start to get to some of those um, evaluations that we can apply moving forward. Um, but never, never forget that you can actually do the evaluation throughout the process. So at the end of the design, you can talk to some target users and see how they react to it. So some final reminders before we get to the Q&A. So if you have some questions as I'm going through these, feel free to jot those in the Q&A panel, um, which is in the WebEx. Some final reminders are modalities are best selected for maintenance, engagement, and reusability. So you want to consider how often do I need to maintain this content? You want to consider how engaging is the, the, um, the content being conveyed, and you want to consider how often you would be able to reuse this content as well. You want to create a blended learning solution using a variety of modalities. So you don't want to just use one type of training. So you, you, know, you don't want to just use all 2D graphics. You don't want to use all bullets. You don't want to use all um, you know, 3D animation necessarily. You want to create a really good blend. While 3D animation is great, if you try and create an entire module out of 3D animation, it's going to be very, very heavy and very difficult to deploy. Um, so use things for their purpose and make sure that you get a really good blend to keep things fresh for the learner. And then finally, engage learner advocates and managers in the training solution. So talk to um, you know, anybody in your training department, talk to some peer mentors, talk to managers, and see how, um, how they feel about what you're putting together. Um, get their perspective because they're the ones who are actually going to be working with the content and working with the learners. Um, so it's really great to keep those individuals engaged as you move forward. Um, so at this point in time, I'm going to go to the Q&A panel and answer some questions. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to jot those down in the Q&A panel right now. Um, so one of the questions that we have is in the company where I work, subject matter experts are trained developer often one and the same individual. Sometimes this results in confusion when one of the roles begins to take precedence. That is, a, that is not something that's unique to your organization. Um, that's something that frequently happens throughout many organizations that we work with. Um, you know, a lot of people wear a lot of different hats. Um, and oftentimes people wear hats that you may not even expect. So you might have somebody who's not necessarily in training, who's not necessarily a subject matter expert, but maybe they have dabbled in training before. Maybe they just have a really strong opinion about how something should be done. 
So one of the things that I've talked about in, in another session is something, something that I call social contracting. Um, so a lot of times it's coming up with an agreement of what everybody's responsibilities are. So it's coming up with an agreement of who's going to do what. This is a great activity for that type of a conversation because as you're going through the decision process of looking at the cards, everybody feels engaged. Um, you know, everybody's working through and answering questions. Everybody is participating in the conversation, so everybody gets their equal say. What I typically recommend at the end of that session is to then kind of make those clear line of demarcation of who can be responsible for what. So, okay, at this point in time, we've all decided what the different modalities are that we're going to use. Um, at this point in time, this individual is going to go into a, approver mode. So they're going to approve things and make sure that it's what we want to be able to move forward with. Um, at this point in time, this individual is going to be responsible for content. Um, so they're going to want to make sure that um, the content is solid and accurate. Um, this individual is more of a technology person, so this individual is going to make sure that everything is functioning properly and everything's going to work well in the system. Um, sometimes those individuals still may be the same and that's okay, um, but it really does come down to communication and conversation to make sure that you're very clearly articulating what everybody's responsibilities are. Um, we have one more question, uh, and that question is, what is the most commonly used format? Um, so of all the different things that we presented, what's the most commonly used um, one? Unfortunately, I think oftentimes most commonly used format is whatever one you're familiar with. So I find that it, it changes by client. Um, so we have clients who definitely go down the route of just using a, a static graphic and bullets. Um, you know, we have one to, once they kind of have that taste of 3D animation, have a tendency to want to throw that 3D animation in there often. Um, so it, it depends. I think probably the three heavy hitters are um, the, the 2D animations, um, the diagrams, and the 3D animation. So those are probably the three different ways, and that's really what the whole purpose of this session is, is to talk about what are the different ways of using those so that they're the most effective. So if you're getting down into the nitty-gritty components of the, the turbine generator, you don't necessarily want that to be 3D animation, and you don't necessarily want that to have a lot of color or, de or um, extra detail to it. You want that to be very crisp and clear so that they can see the different components um, and so that they can see how they all work together. Um, one more question that I do have is how can I get those cards from my team? Um, you will be getting an email with our contact information on there. Just reach out with your contact information, and we can connect with you and help you out with that. So at this point in time, I'm going to turn it back to Nick Morris to close out the session. All right. Thank you, Sherry. That was a great presentation. Uh, we encourage you to continue the conversation with Sherry. As she mentioned, uh, her contact information is available on the slide deck, and we will send everyone a link to a follow-up blog post where she will address a few more of, today, of today's key takeaways. Uh, and again, I'd like to remind you that the recording and slides from today will also be sent to you um, as in, in an email form. Um, so yeah, we don't have any more questions coming through, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thanks again to Sherry, and thanks for everyone who attended for your time and attention. Uh, we hope you'll join us again for our next webinar, The People Side of Sales Enab Enablement on May 7th. Uh, and for GP Strategies, I'm Nick, I'm Nick Morris. Have a good day.